uh, looking at the capital improvement plan. Then I've invited two gentlemen here today, Ralph Gross from Associate, Associated Technical Services. That's correct. Uh, their company tests water mains for leaks um, to determine whether or not the integrity of our water mains and whether or not we have any active leaks right now. And then also Tom Woods from Visisewer. And Visisewer tests, they do a, a jetting and televising where they actually look, well he'll explain it, where they look at the condition of the inside of our sewers to determine whether or not there's any kind of breaks or roots or blockage of some sort. Um, so let me start by presenting the five-year plan. Um, as you can see, what we've done is um, what we've done is determine. And, it, and Mayor Jones, actually, I'm very glad that you're here because if I'm misspeaking about the procedure in this, uh, please correct me. What we've done is look at what our financial capability is both in terms of the money that we have now, what we're showing in terms of excess revenue from our uh, water and sewer fund, and what we're projecting moving forward as revenue from our water and sewer fund. And we've determined a range of what we can afford to purchase or to sell in terms of bonds in order to finance a five-year capital improvement plan. And our, uh, the determination was made that our range would be somewhere between eight and $12 million that we could sell in bonds. With that, a capital improvement plan was put together looking at, first of all, a street survey that was done by village engineers where they went through our entire village and determined what the condition is of each of the streets in our village, ranking it from one to five. And then from that, and then looking at our water main break history, what we've seen to try and determine is there an area that we need to concentrate on, um, that's how we put this plan together. So, go, moving down, so moving down with this, what we've done, sorry, um, What we've done is set, I'll go back down to the street map itself. We've determined a group of streets to be worked on each year. The map is down at the bottom here. And I'll go ahead and move it um, down so you can see the rest of it in a minute. What we've done is determine which streets we're going to be working on each year. Starting with those streets that are in red for the first year, and then those that are in a robin's egg blue for the second year. Coming down a little bit more. I'm going to go ahead, and Pete, I need to move this over. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I need to move this over. So I want to get the whole in here. We're only going to be working on the residential streets, not any of the uh, industrial streets which is why there's no uh, streets colored in red off to the right side. I'm sorry, the left side. So you see right now, for the first year, uh, we're looking at 16th Avenue from, uh, from 16th Street to 14th Street, and a little uh, strip from 17th Avenue to 16th Avenue on four, uh, 15th Street. And then the other street for the first year, is down in the Beverly section, uh, that horseshoe and uh, the little piece of Erico. That's year number one. Year number two is going to include just those streets that are. And I go back up. Just those streets in the Robin Egg blue. So you can see we've got um, parts of. 15th Avenue, the rest of 14th, you know, uh, 14th Avenue, 17th, 17th, etc. Basically, you can see what we're looking at in terms of the overall streets. When we actually go to work on one of these sets of streets in one of these years, 
what we're going to be doing is digging up the street, replacing the six inch water main with an eight inch water main, doing whatever replacement or repair is necessary on the sewers and replacing the fire hydrants and then rebuilding the street on top so that we'll then have a nice new street on top. Um, let me ask you first if there's any questions about the five-year plan as, it, as it's been adopted by the board right now. Yeah, I have a question. I understand about the streets because I did see the copy of that diagram on the, on the website. Mm -hmm. But is that um, the, the 10 or 8 to 10 million is going to take care of all of that over the next five years? Is that that's the assumption of it? That's the assumption and the okay. projection. Okay. Now, um, one of the, the, uh, the statements that was made in the five-year plan is that this is what we're projecting moving forward. It's subject to change depending on exactly what kind of prices we get uh, as we uh, put these jobs out for bid, and also on exactly what our bond proceeds are, whether we go for the 8 million, 10 million, 12 million, and exactly what our proceeds are after we pay all the expenses as well. Are there any questions about the five-year plan as it is right now? Well, I have one. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier that the five-year plan has already been approved by the board. Yes. Well, have we discussed, you know, how the plan has already been approved that you uh, trying to overturn the passage of, of that plan? Well, I will tell you, I am hoping that our village will, that our board will consider uh, amending this plan. And that's the reason that I've asked these two gentlemen to come in and talk about the testing that we should be doing just on a regular basis, but especially in determining where to put our resources right now, uh, the testing of our water and sewer lines. I, do, I am very concerned that we have not actually looked at the condition of our infrastructure when deciding where to put our resources. And I think my concern about this will be a little bit clearer after you hear the type of testing that's done, that's generally done and what we'll learn from that, and how that can be incorporated into hopefully amending the five-year plan. The reason that I was concerned and, and wanted to hold this meeting as quickly as I did, and, and I, had, I, I really wanted to hold this before Monday, is in order to give the uh, residents and hopefully the board, uh, and I say hopefully the board, I've invited all of the board members and I'll be making copies of the presentation, dropping it off for them this evening so that they do have an opportunity to see this and understand the testing. Because on Monday we have another board meeting and while we do have an opportunity to amend this plan, we're also gonna be looking at uh, an engineering contract, committing ourselves to the five-year engineering plan and also uh, hiring a, a new underwriter to sell the bonds. So this is something that I hope we can get the board to consider in terms of the five-year plan before we make any more moves moving forward with this and commit ourselves to the financing. Well, um, along the same vein, uh, let's be realistic. Uh, the, the current board has already approved this plan. Yes. There is some animosity on the current board. Chances are next to nil that you'll be able to persuade them to, 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 change, to change their votes. Um, at the same time, this was built as a, as a committee meeting. The other two members of your committee were not able uh, to make this. Because I'm, I'm thinking, had this been a two committee meeting, you may have been able to make a recommendation, the committee to make a recommendation to the board and possibly change their mind. But minus uh, or absent any other committee members, it's just you. And let's be honest. And with them. And, and trustee, former trustee Ely, I, I completely understand what you're saying and I agree with what you're saying. Uh, which is one of the reasons that I'm trying to make, to, to let the residents of Broadview know what we are actually doing with our capital improvement plan, what I believe we need to do to address, to adequately address this, because you're absolutely right. I, it, one of the reasons that I needed to schedule a meeting like this outside of the village board meeting is I really don't know that I would be able to make a presentation like this at the board meeting. Um, in, a, in a more ideal world, more ideal setting, I would have been able to raise these questions prior to the board adopting this, but I wasn't given the information and time to be able to 
look through it and understand exactly what was being done to create this and uh, whether or not we were doing any of this testing and how, you know, I mean, all of it, in, a, in an ideal world, I would have been able to address this with the board at a time. And, and not only with the board, but as a committee chair and with the other people who were creating this plan. But most of this, yeah. not all of it, uh, involves or uh, concerns your committee. Mm -hmm. You weren't kept in the loop on, on, on this? Absolutely not. Oh, so the board bypassed your committee yes. uh, to do this? Yes. Yes. And I do realize that uh, I, I do realize that it's going to be difficult to convince the other board members of my position, um, but I have to try. I have to try. Tracy, could you tell us who are the other two committee people in your committee? Uh, the other two committee members are Trustee Nicole Benson and Trustee Woody Morris. Let me just say, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but my, my hope is that it doesn't matter who presents what, let's see what we can find what's best for Broadview. That's exactly. what I care about. And having said that, I'm not the only one who had water, but I've had water twice. And I was here when they talked about, you know, when they were going to maybe fund, maybe think about a grant program for whatever the back, back, uh, backflow preventer system. Right. And I looked into all of that. I stopped doing all of that because I was waiting to see what the village was going to do. And I'm not asking that the village subsidize me for anything. But what I'm hoping is that if we're going to do something and we have flooding, then what happens to those of us that are not in the capital gains and whatever capital program. I'm just saying I'm for whatever's best for Broadview. Let's put all cards on the table. I don't care who presents it. Exactly. Um, in that, and actually that's a good segue into the presentations about the testing that is available and for that we can be doing on our water mains and our sewers. So what I'd like to do is invite uh, Ralph Gross and then Tom Woods to give their presentations so we can learn more about the type of testing that uh, is traditionally done on, on water systems. And then we can talk a little bit more about how this would impact us and do this and how we can work this into the uh, body of capital. So uh, with that, I'd like to start with Ralph Gross. Um, Ralph, you want to come up here? Let me introduce you. As I said, Ralph is with Associated Technical Services. Um, there's a number of companies that do the water main testing and he'll explain exactly what they do and how. But one of the reasons that I uh, focused on RELP is because ATS has, was actually doing our water main testing in Broadview pretty much from 1981 until 2008. Uh, not every year, but he'll talk a little bit more about their experience with Broadview. So RELP is able to not only talk about the procedure, but also about his experience uh, with our town in particular. So with that, Ralph, thank you very much and take it away. Well, it's my pleasure. Um, it's, it's a privilege for me to be here today to address you guys. The fact that you're all here today shows that you care and you get enough people that care about something, good things will happen. Um, as Judy said, um, I go back a long ways with uh, Broadview. Uh, my company, just a little bit about me, I'm Ralph Gross, I'm Vice President of Associated Technical Services. My background was in civil, in civil engineering with a firm like that. We learned about this invention, and I'll be talking a bit about this in leak noise correlator. Um, it was the first thing of its type that could actually detect ultrasonically the sound waves that a leak would create by analyzing, timing, and measuring those sound waves. You could calculate to the tenth of a foot where a leak was at. So you could actually say X marks a spot. And by good timing and, and good fortune, we happened to be the first people that took the inventor seriously. So I was lucky enough to be uh, the first student of the physicist that invented this equipment. Uh, back in 1980, it's a brand new company. One of the first towns that gave us a chance to show what we could do was the Village of Broadview, the Westchester Broadview Water Commission, as well as the Village of Westchester. And over the years, we've done an awful lot 
with there. So in the presentation, it's not geared specifically towards this, but I'm going to talk about how links are found, how we do what we do, and the kind of results that you might be able to expect. I will open up to any questions that anyone might have, and then I wrap it up by showing actual results of what we found in Broadview, what kind of water was recovered, what kind of money and revenue that was saved at the same time. So um, let's kind of go with the, let's get the show going. What we try to do is find links. So this is actually in Westchester. And this is a fellow who's long since retired, Tom Meisig. This is on Westchester Boulevard. It's a little difficult to see, but he's pointing down at obviously a leak. So one inch service line that had broken free. And it's a little difficult to see, but uh, on the, in the ground there to the uh, your right of that yellow jacket is a clay sewer line. And what had happened is this leak had started eroded a hole in the side of that pipe. Now it had a perfect place to escape. No reason to fight gravity, the earth, the pavement to come up with the surface. And say 180,000 gallons of water per day, $133,000 a year worth of water is being lost by that with no visible signs. So for anyone to assume that if it's a leak and if it's a big leak, it's got to come to the surface, that isn't often the case. Of course, many times it is. We're all familiar with water main breaks. And I've got a classic example that I'll illustration in here that actually happened in the village of Broadview that was 750,000 gallons of water per day that had absolutely no visible signs until we were able to find that. Uh, how do you know you have a leak? They often come to the surface. You can see them going into the sewer lines. Like Tom's company might say, it's a beautiful sunny day. Why is the storm so we've got all kinds of water in there? And what happens when that happens? If it goes into your sanitary sewer or your storm sewer, now you're reducing the capacity of that sewer line to take care of the water that might happen when you do get one of those storms. If it's already 15 or 20 percent filled with water, you've certainly reduced its ability to get that water away from your home in the event of a storm. But Tom will cover that uh, very well. Uh, sun spike and daily pump, which a lot of times, you know, your public works people are, are brilliant and they have a they have a sense about their water system where they can they can see when pumpage spikes, the amount of water coming in and something's not quite right, and they don't even have an instinct about where it might be in your water system. Where's a good place to go? Judy mentioned about places where you'd be looking at replacing the water system, where leaks typically occur and where you might want to address that. When we do a leak survey and we put in our final report, we will map out on a map the location of each one of those leaks. We have been in municipalities that have taken a, a municipal map and taken a clear sheet and indicated those where those leaks were at on that clear sheet and overlaid that. The following year did the same thing. All of a sudden it starts to develop a pattern. You can see where leaks are occurring. And that's a great place with limited funds where you can start targeting your uh, water main replacement. Everybody has got leaks. Just because you have leaks in your water system doesn't mean anybody's doing anything wrong. We live in the part of the country that is very difficult on infrastructure. We get hot, we get cold, we get rain, we get snow, we have everything. Plus we have age. You know, systems are only built with a lifespan of so long. And so for leaks to occur, it's a natural part of the aging process. So the best thing you can do is try to get these leaks before they turn into something. Now, some leaks are definitely easier to find than others, but they don't always have the benefit of shooting up in the air like that. So this is like to my director of public works. You're sitting in your <coughs> office, sun shining, it's a beautiful day, you're really digging your job today, and suddenly you get the phone rings. And it's the fire chief and he's not happy. What happens quite often is leaks will, over time, erode the ground away underneath or undermine that and the ground can collapse. And this is an actual water main break. This was in California. This other times, you know you've got a leak because the surface is all over the place. So a lot of times fellows would drill holes and they say, we'll figure out where the water is coming up or where it's coming up the strongest. In this particular case, it's coming up in quite a few different places along there. So you make your best guess. In the old days, they would drill holes. Yeah, of course, it's not necessarily the best uh, use of uh, employees' time, but they would drill holes and see which, which hole the water would come out the strongest. So, you uh, take your best guess, and maybe that didn't work out so good. <laughs> this is an actual situation. I didn't stage this shot. There was actually 16 excavations on this 12-inch main. 
before they actually found out where this thing was going. This is it's difficult to see, but it's on a bit of a hill. But uh, obviously, there's an awful lot of restoration. So getting accurate leak location is the key. With it. it also helps you not only find these leaks quickly and efficiently, but also helps control your restoration costs. So you're not digging more holes than you have to and having to restore those holes as well. Um, this gets into different types of equipment. Um, typically, in the old days, you would see with a sonoscope, this looks like an old-time telephone receiver, and they'd listen to, to a line like that. Geophones is something like a doctor with a stethoscope, sort of a glorified stethoscope, but this is very traditional back in the day. And what they would actually do with that geophone is they'd listen, actually listen to the roadway surface directly over the water main and see if you could pick up a leak coming up through the ground like that. Not a very efficient way of doing it. You have to do it in the middle of the night. Any kind of traffic, wind noise, things like that. That, that can really get in the, in the uh, way of trying to find that leak. So correlators were invented, and this, is, this device is actually kind of cool. People think they're too old to get something done, and these were two 65-year-old plumbers that were boy with friends that had an idea. Always wanted to do a project to get to their father's old rival firms. And uh, as luck would happen, of course, they became the best of friends. And so they would get called to find leaks. There was really nothing out there that would say X marks his pause. So they had an idea. Met Alan Hanway, who was my teacher and my mentor, and still a great friend of mine. And they met the Lee Boys Corley. Here's a bit. The guy on the left is ground mining Corley coming through there. This is the first correlator. This is mine, uh, 1980. Um, and uh, we really have, I have done luck in good timing. We happen to be the first people that took the inventor seriously. So we started a company to sell these things. And even though this was light years ahead of second place, ground miking in the middle of the night, at that time they were $35,000, $36,000. There people were lining up at our door to uh, buy these things. So I started shooting leaks, pinpointing leaks, and hopefully staying in business long enough to sell one of the darn things. And as time went on, we transitioned into a service company that can also sell equipment as well. This is the type of equipment I used in Broadview when I shot my very first leak in 1981. This is a listening device. Ultrasonic allows me to go through, and this is what you would see people walking down your street, listening to fire hydrants, listening to valves during normal daylight hours, just basically saying, do I hear a leak or don't I hear a leak? So you're actually looking for the sound that is naturally being created by the leak itself. Not putting a signal into the line, just amplifying that sound that's naturally being created by that water escape through the cracker hole of pipe. This is a one of the early generations of the leak noise correlator. Uh, somewhat portable, though, if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, it's somewhat portable. Uh, it actually has a handle on it, but this is now we're up to about $50,000 on something like this, but it is a, a fantastic device. This is what comes with the listening device. This is what's, what that blue box I showed you earlier, that baby blue box, that's what that's turned into now. And there she is. This is in Austin, Texas, where she's at, and she's able to detect leaks in a, obviously a busy area. They come in different ways now. Now they actually have uh, like their iPads, and we have uh, also smartphones have applications where you can actually use them for there. So it's really changed over the years. But most leaks look just like this. It's a normal street movie, and what I'm saying is you don't see anything happening here. And this is where a leak survey can come into. Municipalities have a um, LMO2 form, an annual water audit form that they fill out to the Illinois Department of Water, Division of Water Resources. And in this, it's sort of a your end statement where you have your how, many, how much pipe is in your system, the age of the pipe. Um, you get write-offs on that based upon the type of pipe, the type of joint it is, the age of that pipe. You have so many allowable gallons per mile that you're allowed to use. It's almost like write-offs on your tax form. And you're supposed to fall within this 8% being your maximum. The amount of uh, water that you pump versus what you build should not be greater than 8% of the loss. Some municipalities are much higher than that. We work in municipalities that are 40 and 50 percent. Not any longer because they address that. So we have some naturally occurring leakages out there. There are other towns that are much less than that. But um, so we're going to talk about doing a leak survey, which is something that we've done in Broadview 10 times over the years. 
maybe you're doing everything right. Maybe you've got an excellent water loss figure. And I mean by that single digits, maybe you're under 8%. And yeah, this was well not last Saturday's paper. I did this slide uh, back in October, but you open up the Sunday paper and you see Mayor Emanuel's got plans for your water bill. And uh, this is something that's already been enacted after the first of the year, but it's going to be a 90 percent water increase coming over by 2015. Uh, the city plans to replace 1,000 miles of water main, 750 miles of sewer, 1,800 catch basins over the next 10 years. And all of us that are Lake Michigan water users are going to help pay for that. So which means that the water that we do get from the city, like Michigan water, is only going to get more expensive coming through that cash register, which is that master meter coming in your village. Those costs get passed along to the residents, of course. So it's going to put that much more emphasis on being as efficient and not wasting any water, making it as efficient with that water as you possibly can. A leak survey is one of those things that will do that. There are different programs. You can do a comprehensive system-wide program. That's what uh, Broadview has typically done over the years. This is going through the entire system, all of the hydrants, all of the valves. Basically, with our equipment, any leak that's within three to 500 feet of any one of these hydrants or valves, we can hear that leak sound. Since you never know where a leak is going to be, and I've got maps that show where these leaks have occurred in Broadview, they're they don't spread themselves out evenly at the time. Some areas will concentrate more leakage in that area than other areas, but you never know where that's going to be, so you cover the entire system. Um, survey costs can go between $50 and $200 per mile of Maine. So how does this, you get a water loss figure? 60% of a water loss figure is typically due to, and this was a nationwide study that was done some years ago, 60% is due to leakage in the system. That's pretty normal. 30% of that water loss figure is often due to inaccurate water meters. When water meters go bad, they'll go bad in your favor because they'll under-register. It's very unusual for a water meter to over-register, so unless something mechanically malfunctions, and that just doesn't happen very often. And the fact that you have Lake Michigan water for all these years, that's a very high quality water, which is very good for your plumbing uh, fixtures as well as your meters. So your meters will last longer than most of them. But that's another thing. That's why your municipality is good about getting on when you talk about meter rotation programs and testing water meters and things like that, what they're doing is making sure that their cash registers are calibrated properly so you get a fair shake. Ten percent can be in accounting procedures as well. Uh, a typical leak survey, in our case, each firm's a little bit different. Some are more skilled than others, but we average about a $15 Fifteen dollars to one, or thirty dollars to one ratio of dollars invested in us versus the water that we buy for in this county. Let's uh, get ready for Shuley here. Basically, what's happened is by listening to valves and hydrants in the system, the sound that's naturally being created by the leak itself. That sound waves travel through the water in the pipe. Water being an excellent conductor of sound. As those sound waves pass by a hydrant or a valve that we're listening to, we'll actually hear that sound. Here we've got a fellow who's listening to a fire hydrant in your upper left corner. We've got a valve box, so we're going to drop down onto that operating nut, or another guy in the center is listening to a valve vault. The closer we can get our sensor to the water of the pipe, the better sounding we're going to get. When we're looking at what points are important, we want to expose a water main is the best way to go, but that isn't often available to us, except in a valve vault where you can actually see the main. And that's a manhole where the valve is in it. And you can look, if you were to open up that manhole cover, you would see a valve, you'd see pipe on both sides of that valve would be attached to the water main itself. Valve boxes would be on the operating of hydro auxiliary valves, fire hydrants, which of course are easy to get to, and beat boxes. You don't often see people deal with beat boxes because they're pretty poor conductors of sound. In other words, you could have a rip roaring leak on your service line, and I could go to your neighbor to the left or to the right of you, and I won't even hear that leak. Maybe the guy across the street, I probably will. So there's, but we do typically get involved with. Uh, B boxes once we detect a leak sound because service leaks are the most common leak that we run into. Rob, could you explain what a B box is? B box is that little enclosure that, that uh, you'll see in your parkway or near your sidewalk typically. And it's about so big 
And it's really an enclosure, it's not a valve. Actually, what's inside the bead box is called a curb stop, and that's the valve itself. And that's what they would use to shut your water off if you were going to make a repair on that line or to encourage someone to pay their water bill. You know, that, so it's a great motivator shutting off the bead box as well. But uh, you'll typically find your bee box around your sidewalk in the parkway or maybe a foot or two beyond that towards there. Typically, in most municipalities, you are responsible for your water line from the bee box towards your home. From the bee box out to the water main is typically the municipality's responsibility as far as if there were a leak on one side or the other. So that would be something you would know. If we were to detect a leak on your service line, and what we'll typically do is we don't know at some point we'll set up the correlator it's going to show up on your service line we don't know if it's on your side of the beat box or not so typically we'll knock on your door let you know that we may be turning the water off for just a minute if the sound goes away we know it's on your side we'll let the municipality know and then they will in turn get in contact with you and work it out however different municipalities have different policies as far as who handles that repair but if it's on the municipal side of the bee box, they will then turn the handle that repair as well. We will pinpoint it. You'll see an X on the ground, as I'll show you in the uh, presentation here. To pinpoint a leak between a house and the bee box, we would need to get inside the home. So typically, a municipality would you know, get in touch with the resident. We would need to get out to your service line where it comes into the house. So we were to shoot a leak here. We've got our water main. Um, First thing we need to do is trace out that water line because they don't always go straight, especially with service lines. So you want to trace it out so you can tell the computer exactly how many feet of pipe you're analyzing. What we have is just like a stereo situation. We've got an amplifier for my left channel on the fire hydrant. We've got a, another amplifier on the valve for my left channel, and the correlator is inside there. That sound is going to be amplified. Those sound waves transmitted back to the computer, which is going to analyze time and measure the sound waves and tell us exactly where that is. Located. He's entering the data. He needs to know the pipe size, which is 8 inch diameter, 12 inch diameter pipe. He needs to know the pipe material, whether it's ductile iron, gray cast iron, which is primarily what's in broad view. And he also needs to know exactly how many feet of pipe is in between that we're analyzing in one stretch. That's why we trace that pipe out so we can measure it accurately. This is some of the screens you can see on the right there, the lower right, where you see like the awful tower coming out of a distant mountain range. That's a leak. And basically what we do is we line a cursor up over that highest peak. And we run many scans and change our filter settings. And I get a digital readout for the tenth of a foot that's going to tell me, in this particular case, 162.5 feet off of microphone A, measured off and put a mark on the ground. Um, that's me. Um, so I've been doing this a long time, since <laughs> 1981. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm measuring exactly how many feet of pipe is between the two points that I'm going to analyze. So I'm measuring off of a valve hall right now, and I'm going to mark where that leak is located. <clears throat> the next thing is to excavate. This is the leak that I spoke about earlier. Uh, this was one of the first leaks that we pinpointed in Broadview. Yeah, just sticking a question because I don't know. You found the leak, but you don't know how, how bad of a leak it is, right? right? Or do your technicians, do their ear tell them that's a oh my god leak and that's a barely leak? Mm -hmm. you know? you're, you're on the right path. There is no way to accurately tell you how many gallons per minute a leak is from the surface until you see it. Now, what, what we do is we're able to classify it by a range of size. Sometimes we find more leaks than the municipality has in the budget to make repairs. So in that particular case, we want to prioritize those leaks. Prioritize your repairs, so we go after the worst ones first. And so we classify them by a range of size. How do we do that? Well, we've heard a lot of leaks. We've seen what they should look like on the scope, and then we've seen them get repairs. You build a kind of a mental library. We know that holes have a very symmetrical shape to them. We know that cracks can have a very jagged shape, whether it's a crack around the pipe or if it's a longitudinal crack. You know, that can be the distance of 20 feet between one point or the other on my screen, not a 20 foot long crack. But things that we indicate that gives an idea of the relative shape and size you know, of the leak itself. So what do we do about those leaks that maybe there isn't a budget to repair right off the bat? Well, we know they're not going to go anywhere. 
the leaks don't fix themselves, they're only going to get bigger. But we can log those locations and as budget and funding becomes more available, the municipality will go after those leaks and make those repairs. So the classifying by range of size, prioritize it from there and just I kind of figured that would be the answer. Well, we'll because we'll like generally what we'll do is we'll divide the system up into manageable chunks of fifty to sixty thousand lineal feet of pipe in a particular area using natural borders. The idea is to do all the detection. We've got 15 suspect sites. Of those 15 suspect sites, once we've re-examined those sites, maybe none of them turn out to be actual leaks, so we can start turning those into the water department so they can start getting the repairs going. Um, however, there are times when we're going to run into a water main break, and we have it in surveys, well, like that one, where there's a main break, and we're going to know this is serious. We're not going to wait till we get done with the area. Water department needs to know about this right now. And this was a particular case here. This is on Roosevelt Road. And um, this was brought in, uh, was doing the work, a pilot survey. At that time, you know, new, new kid, new technology, new invention, new company, everything was new. And Westchester Broadview said, well, we're going to do a pilot survey. So understandably, Broadview was a little reluctant. Westchester was a little reluctant. I'm not the first guy that ever claimed to have a magic box that would find these things. So always looking forward just a shot. Westchester Broadview gave me that shot, so we checked out the transmission main up and down Roosevelt Road. That feeds both of these municipalities. And as a result, we also picked up leaks on side streets. So we picked up six other leaks. But I knew this one was pretty big. The problem with this being a transmission main is earlier I showed you where I'm going from hydrant to hydrant, valve to valve. On a transmission main, I don't have hydrants every 300 feet. I don't have valves in every intersection on a transmission main because it's just to bring a large volume of water out to a town. In this particular case, my other valve was over a quarter mile away. The sound wasn't making it down to that next valve. So I had to go to, who was the director in Broadview at that time, Pat Gamar. He was not too happy that I had a leak on there, especially when I told him, I said, I need you to excavate a hole to the top of the pipe for me. Why would I do that? I don't see, there, there can't be a leak. Any leak on a pipe that big has got to come to the surface and I don't see anything. Mm -hmm. Trust me, there's something there. So you know, he's like, if there is a leak on this line, I will eat my hat because I had to, and that's literally what he said. He had to brand new sidewalk right in front of the Walgreens, which was a brand new building at that time. And here he had to cut right through that sidewalk to get down to this day, and I'm just praying the leak is there. Well, sure enough, we shot the leak, and this is what they found. And it was a 16-inch main broken completely around 750,000 gallons of water per day were being lost through this thing before it ever made it to, uh, to anyone. This is the line uh, putting repairs to the line because it's quite large. But it was accurately pinpointed. So that's just an example. Now, we've been lucky enough that Broadview um, has been early, one of our early believers. And just what can we expect from this? Why should we do a leak survey? I don't see any leaks in town. You know, what are you going to find? Well, it's a, maybe a little difficult to see. I don't know if I can bring it out a little bit. But our, the first leak I found in Broadview, that was November 21st, 1981, when I shot that leak on that 16-inch line I just showed you. Since then, we've pinpointed over 400 leaks in Broadview. So we have a lot of experience in this town. Ten different leak surveys. And what have we found? In 1982, we found 11 leaks. Not too many, but it was 189,000 gallons of water per day which came out about $53,000 a year worth of water. Now it paid for itself many times over. Your water was only 77 cents per thousand. Then. It's not that anymore. In fact, I just happened to check. So in the bottom half of that, after there was a break in time where another firm was brought in because they were cheaper and gave them a shot. But so what I did is I took the numbers below that and I applied your current water rate of $5.07 per thousand. It's going up quite a bit. A lot of people's water is in that high these days, but what does it come out to? We have found 275 leaks during our leak surveys in town. If they were all there, over 3 million gallons of water per day. So on the average, our leak survey is about 300,000 gallons of water per day that was being lost. 
which comes out to over half a million dollars a year worth of water. So the payback is always going to be there. Our most recent surveys we found, 11 leaks, 30, 28, 20, 1985 we found 45 leaks, 96 we found 32, 1998 we found 48, 2002 not too bad, 17 leaks, 20 leaks, and then 24 leaks in 2008. So by the municipality staying aggressive on these things and also fixing leaks as quickly as they could, that helps cut down on those things. Doing a leak survey can also help your municipality on their emergency costs because we know not all leaks surface and sometimes they pick the most. Um, inconvenient of times to surface, and which could be during the winter time, so it can help reduce those main breaks and those overtime costs. What the municipality can do is take a proactive case. What we're going to do is find these leaks so they can schedule those repairs, prioritize those repairs, rather than the leak scheduling your time. But you know, clearly, um, in Broadview, is no different than any other town. Just because there's a lot of actually broad views should be commended because they've done these leak surveys before, which saves the citizens' money and conserves water, which is always a good thing. As I said earlier, every municipality has leaks, some more than others, but everyone has these. So, um, if anybody has any kind of questions whatsoever, I'd be happy to answer them. Just curious about something. That leak that you found in in 1981, where was the water coming from? Hey, it, that's a great question. I should have I'm brought sorry, that up. Could you repeat it? He asked me, he says, you, you found that big leak in Broadview in 1981 on that 16 inch transmission. Leak. Where was the water going? It was, it's, a, it's a great place where it was going. Actually, what it had done is this leak, a lot of times leaks occur over time. I and mean, this probably started off as a small crack and it gradually got to the point it was broken completely around. What it had done is it had undermined a path right alongside the pipe. The pipe was put in bedding, so if the soil's a little bit differently, it traveled alongside the pipe for about 75, 80 feet. What it had done then was it intercepted the drain line between a catch basin and the manhole that was in the middle of the street. You know, the catch basins are those inlets in your curb lines to catch the water coming from the gutter line, runs it down a sewer line into a main manhole that goes out to a main sewer line. So I'm just going to cover all that. It hit the side of that pipe between the inlet and the manhole and eroded a hole in the side of it. Actually wore a hole right through the side. Now it's going right into that pipe, down the line, into the manhole, and it was very happy to keep on doing that. Now, what happens sometimes when main breaks occur and you see a big spike in the pump, which is your public works people say, let's go start opening up some manholes and see if we have an unusual amount of flow in the line. And, say, and that's one way of detecting that a leak may be somewhere in the area. Now, had someone been doing this on a sunny day, they would open up this manhole and say, there's a whole lot of water pouring into here through this line, and I don't see any water going into that catch basin in the curb there. But that's where it was escaping. So now, Sewer lines are designed to take water and carry it away. So it had no intention of coming to the surface, had a perfect place to escape, and could likely have been who knows how long it had been running for. We have found leaks uh, in Elmhurst, I found one in Downers Grove, that were one was over a million gallons of water a day, one was over two million. In fact, one in Elmhurst had been going on for so long that it had undermined when we had pinpointed the main break, the fellow was breaking through this air hammer, he broke through the pavement and he almost went down with it. There was a room underneath there that hadn't been undermined. You could play cards down in there. And fortunately, this was a very good concrete street that had carpet with the crown had bridged over this thing. So that's a testament to the quality of that concrete because it, the road never collapsed. And of course, one of the things we had to do was divert traffic to make this repair because this was a school bus route. So potentially a school bus could have went through that thing at some point. This had gone on for years. So not only were you losing water that was coming through that you're paying for and not getting any revenue in return for, but it was going right into the sewer system, right to the sewage treatment plant, which is already carrying more water than can handle. So this kind of gets back to what happens with flooding. You know, that's why it's important to keep your wastewater collection and your stormwater collection lines not taking any more water than they have to. You know, so that they can handle water when, it, when a storm does come. And yeah, so it can do what it's designed to do. Plus you end up paying for that water to be treated. Well, so exactly. Unnecessarily treating that water as if it was wastewater. Yeah. 
when it was obviously potable drinking water and it didn't generate any revenue for you, you also pay for whatever chemical treatment costs you put in that water, uh, electricity to pump that water. So there is more than just the water itself, it's that whole production part. And finding, finding these leaks is like having a hole in your cash register drawer. You may need to fix it right away because that's money out of your pocket. Because you are, in the old days when we were pulling water out of wells, it was cheap, it was plentiful. But nowadays everything is coming through. Lake water all comes through a master meter. So you're paying for every gallon that comes through there. The least you want to do is you know, either use that water or to get revenue for it so you can do good things with the village. The main thing is just, is, you know, your municipality is monitoring what you're pumping, what you're losing. Those LMO2 forms will give them guidance on what to do programs. Most municipalities do these things on an annual basis because leaks can constantly occur. The type of survey that we have done in Broadview over the years is what we call an incentive-based survey. And you can do a lump sum, all-inclusive, whether there's two leaks, 20 leaks, 200 leaks, price is all the same. What we've done, because as you see by what I showed you earlier, the results can vary. Some years you had 45 leaks, other years you had 17 leaks. So what we do is we have a basically a lump sum for doing detection. We know how long it will take to go through your system, to listen to all the fire hydrants, listen to all the valves. What we don't know is how many leaks you're gonna have, what kind of leaks they are, and where those leaks are gonna be located in your system. You don't pay an extra dollar without getting a leak in return, so that any additional cost is just based upon a per leak basis, whether it's a main leak, a service leak, or a hiking leak. So if your water loss that year is due to a fewer number of leaks, your overall cost is lower. Of course, I'm hoping that it's leaking like a sieve because that's why I'm in business. But the good news is, if there were an unusually high amount of leaks, you don't pay an extra dollar without getting a leak in return. So obviously the incentive is on us to perform as much as possible, but the better job we do, the more water is conserved, the more revenue we recover from the municipality so you get more back for the pot. Before you go, what's the, avoid the B word? <laughs> Bidding. Avoid? Yeah, that's a bit, you know, okay. Bid, bid. Well, what happens, bidding, if we were putting a roof on this building, we know how many square feet the roof is, we know what kind of materials it is, we can set various specifications. In my line of work, I agree, this presentation was really kind of made for a different crowd, but it's still relative to a lot of different things. Um, and compared to some of our competition out there, we find on the average of five to 10 times more leaks than the fellow before us. Bidding sometimes assumes, and wrongfully so in many cases, that no matter who you hire, the end result will always be the same. Like everything in life, you get what you pay for, and people have different skill sets. If some, if it's a Chicago Bulls, or some guys that are good enough to be professional basketball players, but they sit on the bench. Other guys are Derek Rose. So um, as an alternative to bidding, because we realize it's a competitive world, and you do want to get the best price possible, so you get the best value, and value is really important. It's like a poker game, and it's what you ante up is one thing, but what's really important is what you walk away from the table with. So what we suggest is that you do an RFP request for a proposal. We know with an RFP, once we get that letter in the mail, that we're not the only ones being invited to the party. So we're going to sharpen our pencils. We're going to, we're, you're still going to get the same results. But as a municipality, you have more flexibility to exercise the decision that you feel is in the best interest that's going to offer you the best value, that's going to give you a firm, that's going to give you the best quality. So that's, that's what I mean with that. If we're dealing with something, you know, for buying fire hydrants, we know what type of hydrants we are. So I can get Mueller fire hydrants from this guy or Mueller fire hydrants from that guy. So really, unit cost is it's apples to apples. Something like this, there can be quite a difference. Same thing with engineering firms or doctors. Some doctors are better than others. See, would you want to put your heart surgery up with it? You might think about that. So. Uh, two questions. Um, who have you done uh, surveys for Westchester and Elmhurst and who else from around here? Just so Oh, I've, we've done them over 500 cities, over 500 cities in 23 different states. Okay, but I mean, just, I just didn't get a view of, you know. Oh, uh, you know, it's right around here. Well, of course, Westchester, um, Bellwood, uh, 
Oak Park, Oak Brook, Hinsdale, uh, Western Springs, LaGrange Park, LaGrange, Elmhurst, North Lake, Hill Park. Park. And how long does these surveys take to do? Just want to keep, how does a, a water survey take? Is it months or is it weeks? Um, no, it doesn't. We, you, I've got something in here that I, I did bring something that I had to a break on the way it tastes and It can take anywhere from a basically in broad view, anywhere from three to four weeks. So it's something that can be accomplished basically in a month. A broad view isn't the largest system out there. So we basically can average if you've got uh, 50 miles of water main, you know, I would expect to be able to handle that project in three weeks or so. We can cover between 30 to 50,000 feet of pipe per day in a detection hole. That's listening to fire hydrants and valves in the system. As I said earlier, we don't know at that point how many leaks, what type of leaks, and where the leaks are going to be located in the system. So now we get into anything that's remotely suspect is locked to be reinvestigated. So we will then return, resurvey that immediate, that immediate vicinity, then go ahead and set up the computer, that correlator I showed, that roughly doubles our sensitivity. And then we will analyze that pipe electronically. And ironically enough, sometimes it takes more time to disqualify a suspect leak site than it does to pinpoint leak. But our job is not to decide in the field what's cost effective or not, it is to pinpoint that leak no matter what size it is, be able to tell your water department as much as we know about that so they can exercise their best judgment on what type of a repair schedule that they want to put that on. So and it takes about two and a half to three and a half hours to pinpoint a leak. Uh, you mentioned earlier that um, you were doing the water surveys with such a broad view up until 2008, mm -hmm. and you saw the decline that they went um, on that expensive route uh, after that. Are you all that was in the mid-90s when Bob Macaluso was the director. Yeah. And uh, I don't blame them for trying someone else out there. Um, well, the, the people that we have now in uh, and flying that, they've been involved in a lot of things that we've been getting to on with not the uh, workers and the ages and the, uh, uh, the digital readouts from the uh, pumping station and the people that we use. Aren't they doing the job? Are you playing? <laughs> they're, they're not doing the job. I'm not suggesting that. I don't know that for you know, in, without knowing what the results they're getting. I wouldn't have made that Excuse me, I, I just want to clear something up. Uh, Mr. Ely, if I understand correctly, we, uh, ATS was doing the leak surveys for Broadview from 1981 until sometime in the mid-90s. Yeah, until 2000. That was when we, uh, the village tried another company for right. a few years. Right. And then went back to ATS. But I'm not aware of any uh, leak surveys being done since, yeah. since 2008. In the mid-90s, uh, the they, they tried to the they were basically finding a handful of leaks, so it was far fewer than what right. uh, you were saying. In the meantime, the water loss percentage was climbing up. We have a lot. So that's when they brought us back in, yeah. and we were able to you know, get, the, get the village back on track. And that was mm -hmm. I am not aware of anything that's been happening since 2008. Right. So. And it, as far as I know, and, and President Jones, we haven't done any leak surveying since 2008. I do have another question for you, and kind of putting you on the spot, I'm not asking you for your bid or for a specific dollar amount, but can you give us an idea of how much it would cost to do all, to do a leak survey for all of the water mains in Broadview? Um, are we talking 10,000, 100,000, no, 750,000? What, what yeah, so to grab that sheet, so I had some kind of uh, data in front of me, but you're usually, you're usually around 10,000. How much? Around $10,000. Probably. Depending on the amount of leaks that you have, number of mouths you have, water Right. My data is a little bit old because I haven't been in town for a while. So what I would do is I would sit down with your staff 
like a doctor before I can prescribe a treatment, I need to examine the patient. So if the amount of pipe has grown, if you've added pipe to replace water main, I'd like to know what kind of waste have been naturally occurring over the years so I have kind of an idea of what to have a feel for. What are you pumping these days? How much are you selling these days? Let's see what kind of differential that you have there. When you started the pumping station, it was going to go down each street. We will literally go up and down each street. We will ultrasonically monitor every single hydrant, mainline valve, and exposed auxiliary valve. The auxiliary valve is a valve box, looks just like a valve box in the street, except it's right by your fire hydrant. The purpose of that is if someone hits the fire hydrant with their car or whatever it might be, you can shut that fire hydrant off right there so water isn't shooting out into the air like you see in the cartoons. The reason why I have something is in the pumping station is because we, we have uh, all the years getting a lot of leaves especially in the wintertime or spring thaw, we have to get a lot of leaves. And I've been up there, uh, I've been reading some, some various magazines and, and industry manuals. They uh, mentioned that a number of communities across the country have reduced their the water breaks and water leaks simply by going to a, start, a soft start pump. We don't have a soft start. And uh, when the uh, mass not pumps came out, we do. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they just put new uh, pumps in the station this week. And they get prepared to build a new station. But go ahead. The broad in Westchester Water Commission, uh, Water Agency, installed yeah. soft, uh, soft start pumps yeah. recently. Yeah, that's a pump. Yeah, keep up the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Go on with your last question. I'll tell you about that later. I was blaming yeah. it on the yeah. 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 thrust of water gardens. Like, yeah, there are there are factors like that, which is causing kind of a water hammering effect when mm -hmm. things kick up like that. Um, there are surge suppressions that uh, that people put in line that will help control some of those shock waves. Uh, water temperature is a factor, as well as the pressure. You know, within the system. That's another way to control the amount of loss. If you have less pressure in your system, you know, less water can be forced out of those same new orifices. So there is something to that. And finally, can I just ask, I came in a little bit later. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Robin Handabout, and I didn't get, um, if you have done previous surveys before, um, and they're going to maybe start, you know, getting bids or what have you. Are you able to come to an actual board meeting? Um, I haven't been at one for a long time either, but um, you know, this is just a small fraction of, you know, some of our population. And maybe if you had a, uh, it got to come back and did a, a final thoughts, um, you know, as a handout, it would help the residents understand um, exactly what's going on because. You know, obviously you've been in this line of work for a long time. So uh, this would be real helpful um, to speak to a, a, a larger group of people versus the smaller group like this. And then you have maybe some handouts on your final thoughts page. Absolutely. Um, I would be happy to do that. And we kind of put this together rather quickly, which is fine. Yeah, I'm not going to turn down this opportunity. Um, but you know, given that opportunity to make a presentation and say to a board or citizens group, I would certainly put something together that was more personalized to provide you specific experience and what type of realistic, realistic expectations you might be able to expect and what would be involved. We can talk about you know, costs and things like that and alternative things. The more I can learn about your water system by sitting down with your staff and finding, like I said, doctor examining the patient to prescribe the proper treatment, the more I can learn about the system and its current status, not what I knew 15 and 30 years ago. The, different types of programs that I can have that can be customized to, the, to broadly specific needs. And certainly, what should be a, that would be a great I just think it would be real helpful to a lot more people. Okay. And I wanted to say, too, uh, two things. First of all, as I said earlier, uh, we're recording this presentation and I'm making copies of the recording for all the board members because I know I needed to put this together quickly and I did it according to Ralph and, and Tom's schedules you know, when they were both available. Uh, not everybody could make it here on a Saturday afternoon. And then Ralph and Tom have both agreed uh, that they will be here on Monday for the board meeting in case any of the board members have questions, have anything that they'd like to discuss then. So. Thank you for coming on such a short notice. It's good to be informed that we are a village moving forward. So.
think we've heard he's coming out to talk to those of us who are interested in our community. It's, it's my pleasure. I uh, I still got a couple of questions. Yes, sir. You have a, a baseline price. Uh, you said that the price in general were roughly about ten thousand dollars. Your baseline price is based on what? It's based on the amount of pipe in your system. So it's based on the linear feet of pipe? Correct. The type of pipe, or the size of main? Uh, type of pipe is a factor when we get into what I would do is sit down with your fellows and say, okay, where is, do you have any non-metallic pipe? Now, gray cast iron, ductile iron, water main, sonically transmits leak sounds very well. So hydrants, valves, we can do, a, you know, pick up everything and go through very efficiently. If you were to say we have a part of the system that has PVC, plastic or HD pipe, which is even softer, that would be an area where I would want to modify my survey technique. And that's some place where I might incorporate meat boxes. That's going to take more time. So I would probably incorporate that because I don't want to leave any stone unturned. The volume of water going through the system has no impact and no bearing on your cost. Well, certainly if you tell me that you know, we pump 2 million gallons of water a day and we've got a 22% water loss compared to perhaps someone that has a 6% water loss, I should expect that there's going to be more leaks present. But with an incentive-based program, if I'm you doing a lump sum, I'm going. Yeah, yeah, you're, with the incentive you're getting, getting ahead of me, go ahead. Yeah, with the incentive-based, it's price per leak. So, right. yeah. so, so what is your price per leak? Your two hundred ninety-five dollars per leak on a main line. So roughly three hundred dollars a leak per main line. Main line and service leak. Hydrant valve leaks are cheaper. They're usually around a hundred bucks because I can do those in less time. So it could range from one hundred to three hundred dollars. Or it's going to either be one hundred or three hundred per leak. Yes, sir. And it's going to be dependent on the location of the leak or what kind of line. It's that gets into the into the detection phase because I'm really, really looking at how many points do I have to monitor. I know that, for example, um, Broadview is laid out in a grid, nice rectangular blocks, so we can make a pretty good time going through there, covering all those points. When you get to a, a more contemporary subdivision where you've got curb streets and cul de sacs and curly cues and everything else like that, just like your snowfall drivers, that slows us down too. So we incorporate that in as well. So when you say your, your basic fee for the village of Broadbent, ten thousand dollars, is that the base fee? Was that was that time you said was that out there. was that would be that? Oh, that was just just throwing number out there. Okay, because I was trying to figure out whether this base fee, inclusive of the uh, number of rates that you had found, or whether it was just the base fee prior to adding the rates that were Yeah, I was trying to recall off the top of my head what the detection price works out in this town. And I think you're basically looking around 125 to 150 dollars per month for detection. And uh, well, and, uh the other added cost is how many uh, <coughs> leaks are out there. And I'm just speaking very generally, of course, you know. Because we want to make sure that the job is uh, you know, as economical as possible, but then also we want to make sure that there's enough money in the job to do it properly. And then the, the last thing that I have, is there a particular season that's better for you to be able to identify these uh, as it relates to being able to hear through the ground or be able to detect the uh, sounds? In other words, is it better to do it in springtime, summertime, fall, or winter? And what would the reason be for that? Uh, really, it, this could be done any time of the year. Uh, wintertime more difficult just because of the adverse weather. You know, with snow that might cover up valves that we're looking for, just being able to find them. Frozen covers, having to open those things up. So, yes, you know, spring. You know, it's always nice to get in there spring, summer, because what you've done is you've got that fresh crop of leaks that have been created by winter before they've really had a chance to cost you any more money than they have already. So you're uh, catching that fresh crop of leaks that were caused by winter's frost before they have uh, a chance to really do cost you any more than that. So you're basically while they're young. So the basic function at the end of the day is just to locate and identify where the leaks are. That is correct. We will locate them, we'll pinpoint, you know, X marks the spot, hand in a written leak location report that will tell you uh, exactly where that leak is located. And then, yeah, if necessary, we can help the water department prioritize those leak repairs as well. So we'll go after the worst ones first, go from there. You can also, we're on each one of these points, those points can be located with GPS as well. We're excited to do that type of thing with mapping out your program, get a GIS map going on that. 
Um, other factors involved with your system maintenance is hydrant flow testing, making sure those what type of water is delivered by the fire hydrant in case it's needed by the fire department. They know what they can count on, that it's going to be in excellent shape, and that that fire hydrant isn't leaking all year. Uh, exercising your main valves. Every valve in the system should be exercised at least once a year. That way, if, let's just say there is that main break, the guys can count on being able to turn those valves down, isolate that block without putting more people out of water than they have to. Worst case scenario is an old story, so I guess I can talk about it. It's a Marine Park Road in Schiller Park. They had, uh, Marine Park Road has several mains that are run parallel, they're interconnected. This particular case was a leak on a 12 inch main, and they knew from previous main breaks that not all the valves operated properly. So they were going to do was, but they didn't know which ones. So they're going to fix this main break on the fly. So they excavated down to the pipe. Murphy's Law was alive and well, and right when they got down to that main, the pipe broke again close by. Now you have a 12-inch main running free. If this particular section where the lake break was at, it took the, would have, if they were all working properly, it would have taken 13 valves to shut that section down. They had to turn the entire water system off in the city to make this repair. So then we were brought in to determine, well, okay, once and for all, which valves are working, which valves aren't working. And I developed a program to do that, made a presentation to the board, and went through. So that's a worst case scenario. So even inconsequential things are very important when you need them. So valve maintenance is something that municipalities are doing to make sure that they function properly. That's exercising a valve is opening and closing it by certain procedures so many turns at a time. There's a proper way to do that. Um, you've seen fire hydrants being flushed. You're really flushing the water maintenance what you're doing. But also by operating that fire hydrant, you're ensuring that it works properly. Mineral buildup tuberculation that builds up inside the pipeline and builds up on things just like plumbing fixtures in your home. You're breaking that stuff loose when you're operating those things. You're ensuring that that fire hydrant operates properly when you need it. And certainly the fire department knows what kind of flow is coming out of it. So there are a number of different things that you can do to make sure that your system is functioning as efficiently, as properly as possible, in addition to leaks which are important. The other thing I'd like to share is from our LMO2 reports, um, the last two years, in 2010-2011, and this is a fiscal year that ends in September. So uh, in two as of uh, September 2010, our unaccounted for water loss was just over 7%, and then in 2011, it was closer to 6.5%. Yeah. I also make a comment when you were, now, I, I don't know where the village will have to conduct the lease survey, but it sounds like a good thing to do as a resident listening to it, just to know where we are. But keep it in mind, I heard you say that Robbie was one of the ones that brought it to the system early on and gave, yeah. kind of gave you your start. Okay. So I want you to keep it in mind when you're giving us a price, okay? <laughs> I just got to throw that out, you know? Robbie is always going to be special to us. You know, we okay. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we're going to go ahead and switch now from Ralph to Tom from Business Sewer. So this will just take a couple minutes uh, to change the flash drives in that. In the meantime, we've got some cookies and punch and water and candy and stuff. So want to help yourself, and we'll pick this up again in just a, maybe two or three minutes. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.